What's up, guys? Welcome back to Rule of Two. Mark and I have a very special guest today, Matthew Stover, the man who has written many different novels, uh, including Shatterpoint, The Revenge of the Sith novelization, The Tenebrous Way, which is super cool, very underrated. I don't know if many of you know about that, but we're going to talk about it. And Luke Skywalker and the Shadows of Mindor, plus many other novels outside of Star Wars, such as one of my favorite franchises, God of War, um, which I want to talk to you about too. So how's it going, Matthew? Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. All right. So one of the first things we usually talk about uh, whenever we get a guest on, we started off by asking, you know, uh, when you were writing Revenge of the Sith, uh, what was it like working with George? How much insight did he give you? Um, anything you could take us through with that? Well, um, when I was originally hired to, uh, to do the book, um, what they gave me was uh, the shooting script, of the final shooting script of uh, the movie. And that's what I was working from, uh, kind of like an outline. Now, I already had, um, you'll excuse the phrase, a shit ton of Star Wars related materials, uh, not just uh, the published uh, books, but also their uh, supplementary materials, all their all the different guidebooks and um, a bunch of the comics and some fancy uh, uh, database uh, containing. Was this because you were a fan or because they had given them to you? I, they had given them to me. The Revenge of the Sith was the third book that I did for Star Wars. Mm. And so I had, so I had a, had and still have uh, a fairly extensive library of, of source material. Um, beyond that, I they flew me out to Skywalker Ranch to spend an afternoon with Mr. Lucas. And basically, we spent the day um, talking about Jedi, which was cool, man. exceedingly cool. That's, That's cool. cool. And, 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 I'm, I'm getting some feedback, feedback. Mark, yeah, me Mark. Too, me too, me too. Why is uh, it? I'm not hearing it. Do you want to mute yourself? yourself? Mark? That's you good now? good now? No, still, still let go. Anyways, um, when you were working on Sith, so there's, there's this talk about, you know, the four-hour cut of Revenge of the Sith that everyone wants to see, and uh, whether that's real or not, I don't know, but we all assume... About it we all assume that there's some sort of director's cut in the novel. You wrote so much more that was in the movie that I really appreciated that added so much more to the character development of not just Anakin, but really everybody. Um, how much insight did you have with like, was George feeding you th those ideas or did you have free reign to just add to all those scenes? I yourself? had a, a certain amount of free reign. Um, his, his explicit instructions, uh, to me were to not do anything that violated uh, the story. Right. Right. The story as, as presented in the film. Right. And, um, but beyond that, he said, um, you know, do whatever you want, just make it good. Fair enough. That's yeah. what I tried to do. Now there, there are, um, there were some things that, uh, that he changed uh, personally, um, yeah. uh, ideas that I had that he didn't like. And he, and even, even down to, uh, you know, occasional individual words here and there, he just, he was, he did a line edit and there were things that he didn't like in the way I did it. And he just struck them out, changed them. I see. So, so the final version is very much, um, I would have to say uh, uh, it's very much a collaboration between uh, me and him because it right. was his story and then my words and then his edit. Right. And, and not just him. I mean, the, all the people at uh, there was input from, uh, from Del Rey in New York and from uh, Lucas books. Sure. On the West Coast as well. So essentially it's, it's George Lucas approved is what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Yeah, cool. that's my understanding. That's 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 how it was explained to me when they sent me back his uh, line edits, and uh, um, I, there was some. They had some things that they wanted me to adjust myself rather than just have them do it. And so, you know, that was that was what I was told. Right. 
And in your, is, is that echo gone? It feels like it's gone. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. you're good. It, in your um, uh, shooting script that you had, and, and I know you kind of touched on this a little bit, in the scene where Anakin goes into the Jedi Temple, uh, which is probably my favorite scene in all of Star Wars, uh, from a from a cinematic point of view, that shot and the music and the character and just all of that togetherness of you know twenty five years of lore coming into one picture of Anakin walking into the temple with the clone troopers behind them. I mean, just thinking about it, I get chills. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. probably probably my singular favorite scene in star wars is that it is um, a pretty nice piece of filmmaking right there yeah it, it really is it's a beautiful piece of i'm getting chills right now thinking about it um when when you were writing that scene um did you have some stuff to go from once anakin gets inside the temple that you got a little direction on or, or, no. on 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 how he starts tackling the other no. jedi or was nope. it just nope. like the shooting script damn yep. i wanted to see so much more inside yeah. the temple of what he does. So let me ask you a question. Um, why I, why do you think there isn't more of the Neo Matrix, let's go kick 50 people's asses in that scene? Well, um, uh, if I recall correctly, mm -hmm. from the shooting script, uh, the only actual confrontation with another Jedi he uh, comes across is uh, Syndralic who mm. was the lightsaber instructor. Yeah. Um, in the video game, that whole scene is actually played out. Mm -hmm. You also added that bit in there in the front where I forgot his name. Uh, he comes to answer the door when Anakin's there and Anakin, uh, you wrote that Anakin just ignited his saber through his skull. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was so dark. Yeah, I, I don't, it I don't, so cool. I don't actually, I don't actually remember um, that line specifically, but that does sound like something I would do. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's there, um, I did feel the need. It wasn't, um, as I, I seem to recall, that there wasn't much in the way of um, security mm. at the Jedi Temple. Um, in the movie and you know it, it struck me that they there should at least be um a doorkeeper but i don't i i honestly don't remember if that was in the script or not i mean okay. you know i wrote that 16 or 17 years ago yeah yeah, yeah. fair enough um so, go ahead go ahead, go ahead yeah so as a writer um when what what's what's your process like do you um carve out time where nobody can talk to you uh are you prone to writer's block how do you combat writer's block kind of like what's your high level mental preparation when you well, got to tackle something like this um i i did always try to um uh, carve out uh writing time but um being married mm. There are, you know, just like um, there are inevitable interruptions. Um, the other people in your life need your attention from time to time. And also, I, I tend to not do very well in really long stretches. Mm. I have some chronic health issues and I'm, I'm good for I'm good for two or three hours at a time i can i can do okay and then i need to rest for a little bit and then i'm and then i can get back to it but uh when i was also when i was working on revenge of the sith i was still working a full-time job oh really wow. yes because uh because you know before obamacare i could not afford health insurance oh wow and with my again like i was saying i had some i have some chronic health issues and uh yeah yeah um it it has only been in the last few years that I have been able to um, to stop working day jobs. Interesting. Okay. I, I, and that I, actually I has more to do with my family helping me out than than with my uh, stellar success. <laughs> but look, well, it's good to have I, family. I would say, yeah, I'd say, in my eyes, you're extremely su successful for the things you've written and and the ideas well, you put you. forward. You're very talented, and I I hope more people go out and buy your books um i'm gonna flash them again so you guys see and there's many more um probably at the end of this interview because i know it's not related to star wars but i'm a huge god of war fan i mm -hmm. 
would love to talk about the book uh, later at the That's end. Fine. That's fine. Um, which That's of your kind books... of an interesting story. Okay. Which, which, which of your... only, it's my only collaboration. I mean, really? literal collaboration. Oh, okay. Um, Do you want to so... go into some detail about it now? I'm... Well, uh, it's it's kind of a long story that would distract, uh, I think, from, uh, from Star Wars focus. But I'll just say that, my again, my health issues mm -hmm. uh, put me in a serious bind on uh, on a completely unreasonable deadline that yeah. uh, that Sony uh, imposed on me. And uh, so my my agent uh, valiantly found um, actually a, another writer of my acquaintance to come in and bail me out. And that's that's Bob Vardaman, Robert E. Vardaman, whose uh, name is also on the cover. Um, did I, I would say arguably the lion's share of the work. On okay. that. And then on the, I believe the sequel, um, they just didn't even, they just went ahead and let him do it. Okay. Fair enough. Because, you know, he's great. Right. Yeah. He, he, he saved that project. Okay. Um, going back to Star Wars, you wrote Shatterpoint and of course this one. A fan sort of fiction uh, fight scene I've always wanted to see uh, was Mace versus Anakin. In your head, who do you think would win? Has George ever talked about anything like that? If Anakin and Mace had fought, I know with Vapad, it's you know it's it's Anakin. I feel like he would have to be in the dark side in order to be able to. Um, I feel like if he was in the dark side, Mace would then beat him much easier. But if he was a Jedi fighting Mace. I feel like it would be more difficult for Mace Windu, but I want to know what you think. Well, you wrote them. Um, it is canonical that Anakin has transhuman reflexes. I mean, the only human ever to finish a pod race, and he was what? Right. Eight? Yeah. Right. Very fast. He has, Very he, has, he and and he is popularly considered the greatest uh, fighter pilot in the galaxy. Uh, right. Obi Wan. Says so in the, in uh, I think uh, New Hope. Mm -hmm. um, so Anakin, I think, uh, would have a definite edge, right. um, and his sort of innate aggressiveness uh, would, I would fairly well counter Mace's. Jesus, I mean, you know that's that's kind of the, the key to the key to uh, Mace's fighting style is is his uh, is a uh, a kind of overwhelming ability to attack um uh, aggressively many from many directions at once right and uh, if anyone was would really be capable of of matching that hand to hand it's probably anakin dude you're uh, i'm not wow. sure i'm not sure that i would give anakin an edge over mace Okay. But I'm also I, I think it would be a I think it would be a very even fight. That's insane. Uh, different styles. Well, also Anakin's force powers are operated at a higher level than Mace's. Mace's are more precise, but Anakin is just he's just tremendously powerful. Yeah. So so was the advantage <laughs> of the high ground that that large, you know, for Obi Wan? Um, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, I I. Uh, I have a little bit of um, combat training myself. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, sword fighting of that style, it's it's arguable. Mm -hmm. um, it's not it's not the way I would have written it. But right. uh, how would you have written it if? If you had free reign. Ooh, ooh, that's a tough one. Um, because actually, when I was um, when I was writing the the uh, novel, I made a conscious decision not to focus on the things that people were going to be able to see on screen. Interesting. In the film, um, you may notice that that uh, almost nothing uh, in the story is described. Uh, like visually described, except for, um, you know, devices that we have seen from other films mm -hmm. and things like that, you know, X-Wings and, and whatever, because I knew what those were going to look like. The other stuff, 
No, I didn't know. The only thing I, the only thing I really knew about the physical environment was that the, uh, that Grievous's flagship had a, uh, a tower on it that, uh, I think they, they refer to in the screenplay as, I mean, in the, the stage directions on the screenplay, not, mm -hmm. not in the dialogue as the wizard's tower. Oh, wow. Um, that's, but that was all I knew about how things were going to look and none of the, um, actual fighting is described in the shooting yeah. script, of course, because that's, that's what you have stunt coordinators and, and people, right. you know, they come in and, and do that kind of in the moment, I guess. Um, uh, how I would have done it. Hmm. I probably, I probably would have, um, resolved that fight by having Anakin overcommit. Mm. Um, uh, try too hard, uh, swing too wide, and uh, Obi Wan pull a kind of Aikido like move and flip him into the lava. And that's mm. probably what I would have done if I were if I had free reign to write it. Mm. But uh, but I, I, I like that. I think it's kind I of think, similar. I think that the reason that um, line is in there isn't is very likely not so much an actual sort of endorsement of the concept of of high ground meaning victory as it was um obi-wan having the advantage taking a pause giving anakin one last chance to surrender you know it was it it was i think a way for obi-wan to say to say, look, you're going to lose this fight. Give up now, and you know we can we can try and make things right. Yeah, I know. Every time I watch the movie, I just like I wish he takes him up on that offer. And it's like, well, of course, me, that's the power of that of that story is that mm -hmm. even though you know exactly what's going to happen because you've seen it a hundred times, you always hope for a you know for a different ending. I wanted to bring up yeah. something that I found well, that's, very. That's actually, I, I wrote that at the very beginning of the book. Oh, really? Um, I don't know if you remember that, but the the actual introduction to the book talks about how this is a this story took place a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It is already over. Nothing can be mm. done to change it. Wow. Right? I like that. <laughs> I like that. Because I, I was kind of trying to lean into the whole uh, epic tragedy yeah. of the uh, of the prequels. Mm -hmm. Right, where, where the hero is the villain. There, there's just one curiosity that I wanted to bring up because I, I, I found it pretty fascinating. Um, there was a version of the Star Wars Revenge of the Sith book that called the Fan Club Exclusive Signed Hardcover. Do, mm -hmm. do you remember this? I don't know about Fan Club Exclusive. I remember the limited edition. It was yeah. a black, uh, black bound slipcase. The, uh, the, the cover looks like that. Does that ring a bell? Uh, no, so no, so I don't know that one. So that, that, that must have come out later. So that version of the hardcover book now is going between six and seven thousand dollars a copy. Well, it, it must be very, very rare. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was just wondering if maybe you had one of them because the artwork is also very interesting. I like, I mean, theory, have you ever seen that artwork before? Yeah, I've seen that. I just didn't know that that's what it was for, actually. Yeah. I didn't yeah, know it's an know. exclusive cover. That's cool. I don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, my, my work for, for, uh, for Star Wars is, is basically, I mean, I get, I get royalties, small royalties, but it's basically, I'd hope uh, it's a, basically uh, purchase. You know, they, it's, I don't have any rights to the work and they can put out new editions, you know, whenever they feel like. Yeah. That's what they're doing with uh, Shatterpoint. Right. Right. I didn't even I didn't even know about that until somebody on Twitter um, pointed it out to me. And uh, yeah, and I was I was very excited, actually, uh, yeah, yeah. especially about the news that the they were uh, doing a new version of the audio book that was going to be on a bridge. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's awesome. cool. I mean, the, the original audio book is is uh, really good, but I was it, just listening to it again. Yeah, to... it's uh, it's what it's it's only it's ten or twelve hours or something like that. 
And, uh, you know, it's a longer book than that. I, I listened to it on like twice the speed. So it was like, I think oh. it was about six. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I usually but, listen to my audiobooks back, like twice. Back, back in those days when you were writing the extended universe stuff, like, like Shatterpoint, what, what kind of direction do you get at that point when there's no script? There's no, like, do they basically tell you we want to do a story about Mace with this thing it happening? Varies. It varies. What, what they wanted me to do, what they initially told me to do when they hired me to write Shatterpoint, the, what is now Shatterpoint, they, they wanted me to write a, uh, a story about Mace Windu to kind of uh, uh, focus on him as one of the main characters of the Clone Wars sequence. Right. They kind of wanted to, they wanted something that was going to foreground him. And I said, okay, that's cool. I like Mace, no problem. Yeah. Uh, and my original, uh, I spent, oh, three months probably coming up with a very detailed outline uh, that had Mace infiltrating, uh, infiltrating the smuggler's moon, Nar uh, mm -hmm. to break up, um, uh, uh, hut, uh, gambling syndicate with ties to the trade union stuff. And there was, you know, there was a cocky pilot and comic relief droids and, hmm. and all the, all the usual trappings. And when I sent that back to them, they said, no, 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 this is not what we want at all. Hmm. We're, we're looking for something that is, we want to, we want a war story. We want it to be set during the Clone Wars, which nobody knew what the Clone Wars were actually like yeah. at that point, yeah. uh, especially in the, the early days, because we didn't have the, the series yet when mm -hmm. I was working on it. And uh, uh, they, they said they wanted a, a horrors of war story like, uh, like All Quiet on the Western Front. And being you know, a book guy myself, I realized that I couldn't just rip off All Quiet on the Western Front because in that one, everybody dies. Right. Everybody. Uh, so what I what I came up with after a long conversation with uh, with editors, uh, both in in at Skywalker and in New York, um, I came up with with the idea. Uh, it was basically a one line elevator pitch. I said, okay, well, how about if I do Apocalypse Now with Jedi in it? And they said, okay, do that. And that was my outline. Hmm. You know, ordinarily you have to submit an outline and they, yeah, they yeah. look at the plot and they, they, they said, they said, Apocalypse Now with Jedi sounds great. Go for it. So that's, that's what I did. Although my book, that book, I think owes more to the source material for Apocalypse Now than to the movie. So the Heart of Darkness Heart by of Darkness. Joseph Conrad. Yeah. Heart of Darkness is one of my favorite novels. <clears throat> yeah, it's a classic. Mm -hmm. It felt like a like a Commando meets or like Predator meets uh, Star Wars a little bit with everything in the Maybe jungle a little, and a little bit like yeah, Maybe had a little, that it's jungle vibe. A hostile environment, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was neat. Um, going back to Revenge of the Sith, and then I'd love to touch on the Tenebrous Way um, if you remember some of it. Um, when it came to Mace fighting Palpatine, there are so many different answers. So apparently, you know, in, in interviews, George has said, okay, yeah, Mace fairly beat Palpatine. In your novel, you say Mace beat Palpatine. I asked Ian McDermott once at a signing, and it's like, did Mace actually beat him, or did Palpatine just fake it so Anakin could get there and he could manipulate him? He's like, oh, Palpatine faked it. But of course, he would say that. I yeah. want to know what, what your insight is. Um, as I always thought Palpatine, you know, faked that loss. It's kind of how it, it was portrayed to me in the film. But of course, I'd love to know what you think. Well, I think that if Palpatine had, Palpatine had faked his lost maze, there'd be no reason in the plot for Anakin to be there. Right? You, you bring Anakin in because he's the, he is, as, as Mace realizes, he's the, the, the pivotal, um, the pivotal the shatter point of yeah. the, right, the shatter point yeah. of the war. 
um, and that that he is he is it's it's Anakin's choice that kills Mace, not Palpatine's skill. Right. 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 And uh, so if uh, if Palpatine is faking, then eh, it's just it's kind of a con game. It loses some of its force, loses uh-huh. its moral force as an event. Absolutely. I always felt like Palpatine wanted Anakin to make the choice, and that's why he put him in that position. Yes, I believe that is. I believe that is correct. Um, but uh, it's hard to say. I mean, you will. You may notice that of all the major characters in Revenge of the Sith, uh, Palpatine's the only one who never gets a point of view. You know, he doesn't That's get true. any of those. He doesn't get any of those little sort of soliloquy things. You know, the the yeah. this is Obi Wan Kenobi right now he doesn't yeah. get any. Yeah, um, because because fundamentally, um, I think that it's it's important to the story that he remain a mysterious figure uh, to some degree. That that the details of his plot are always discovered by what happens rather than by some internal monologue coming from some author in the Midwest. Mm. Okay. I right, see. The intention, the intention is always clouded in mystery. Right. And it, you know, but, but the, but the plotting and the sort of Machiavellian outcome is right. always like how, how he operates. That's, right. that's really you, you, you understand the plan after it comes to pass. Yeah, I, I tried to I tried to get to that point early on uh, with the scene with Dooku, yeah, uh, Dooku's death in yeah. in uh, the early chapters, um, where where it's only at the moment when it's too late mm-hmm. for him to do anything about it that he truly understands his part in in the Emperor's plans. Yeah. 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 I mean, that sounds like almost like verbatim the line from Return of the Jedi, right? Only now that it's too late. Oh, yeah. Do you do realize, understand? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. It, you know, cool. it, treachery is the way of the Sith, right? Yeah. Yeah. Could I mean, you go you guys, into. You guys call yourselves the rule of two. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, in the novel, you go into so much more detail about. Dooku's plans, you know, he thinks that him and Anakin are going to eventually team up and, you know, and with Palpatine and they're going to be this kind of triumvite kind of Sith mm-hmm. collective thing. And then he's going to go back and turn all force users in the galaxy, young and old, into um, dark side users under mm-hmm. his rule. Can you go into some detail on that? Because there are a lot of people that don't know that Dooku actually did have a plan of his own, that he wasn't just following Sidious and thinking, you know, okay, I'm just going to well, be his... I, I think that it. I think it was it was important for me to have to give Dooku his own plans and his own intentions uh, because it it goes to my basic my sort of basic artistic conviction as a writer that um, what matters about a character is what they are trying to achieve. And what they are willing and able to do to get it, right? And so, I thought it was important for Dooku um, to believe in his own mind that he was the master, that he was the master manipulator and arranging mm-hmm. things um, to his own liking, right. believing that he understood um, uh, the Chancellor's plans. Um, also, because it makes it makes the uh, the betrayal mm-hmm. uh, when when Palpatine says says kill him kill him now yeah um, uh, a lot more devastating right because Dooku never sees it coming yeah. but Dooku had that arrogance to think that he was inevitably going to do the same thing to Palpatine that Palpatine did to Plagueis right so that he had him at bay you know he was playing zone defense strong enough. That he knew how far Palpatine would go, but that it completely catches him off guard. I, I totally get that from a writing perspective. Like mm-hmm. um, making that the truth inside his brain seems very important to like, you know. Well, and he, 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 you also wrote in that that Dooku 
originally was supposed to just toy with Anakin and test him and lose to him on purpose and be arrested. And then all of a sudden, Anakin turns into this uh, furnace, or, or he notices the furnace within him that's just constantly burning, which almost reminded me of the Hulk. It just seems like he just keeps getting more and more powerful as time goes on, as he gets angrier and angrier. Well, right. The passion, um, right. passion and the dark side are kind of go together. Yeah. And you you mentioned that he that Dooku says that he was already half Sith at that point. Yeah, I, I, I think I think that that's Dooku's opinion anyway. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. uh, because you know, I I don't I try as a writer not to um, not to make statements in the sort of omniscient voice, right? Um, uh, like that because. I think that takes something away from the reader's enjoyment because they they're kind of I think what they're what people come to this book for is is a look inside the heads of these yeah. people that they know so well from yeah. from seeing them on the screen and um, so I think that what is what is important literally is not so much the the absolute truth of the situation as the various truths of the individual character's points of view. I see. Yeah. And kind I, of a, a little callback to uh, return of the Jedi. I thought it was just really cool the way you wrote that. And that, okay. that from, from his point of view, he's already half. It was just, it was cool. It was um, something I didn't expect, but um, going also, on to, go yeah. ahead, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to jump to Tenebrous way. So keep going. Keep going. Um, I really like the uh, the furnace line because it's it's really strong. When when I had my first chance to meet George Lucas, uh, we you know we did a clothing line with him way way back in the day when I worked at Echo, mm -hmm. and um, he said that when he started working on A New Hope, um, that he always knew in his head that um, that you know Anakin or, or Darth Vader. I'm sorry, it was Darth Vader. Right, uh, died on the lava planet. Like he always had that lava planet, like visual right. in his head. Um, and you know, right. well, it's really, well, we, sorry, that, that rumor, that rumor came out, uh, before, uh, empire. Right. Cause there's the, well, there's that, that moment in empire where you see him from the, from behind without the helmet on and his, his head is all scars. Yeah. Right. It's all burnt and, and yeah. Burn scars. And right. And, and there was, I remember hearing the rumor. I was, I don't. I don't even remember. Eighteen, maybe when when that movie came out, and uh, and yeah, people were like, oh, "Oh yeah, he fell into a volcano." Right, right. Because right. Ralph McQuarrie had done some Lava Planet uh, concept right. art stuff. Uh, so but the, it, the the theory at the time was that he had fallen into a volcano and called upon the dark side to save his life. Right. Right. Was that actually in your head, like like when you were doing some of the Star Wars novels, like you had that little bit of, of of what you thought was? Oh yeah, it's all it's all there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Sometimes I don't know it's there, right? But but it's all there. I mean, I I saw I saw Empire Strikes Back in the theater twenty eight times. Oh, Jeez. good for you. Um, because it, I was in college uh, when it came out, and it ran forever. Uh, I went to Drake University in Des Moines, and it ran forever. It ran for a year and a half in Des Moines, and oh, on wow. Tuesday on Tuesday nights in Des Moines, um, all the theaters were were running two dollar tickets, and so when it get to it would get to be a Tuesday night, and we didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> well, let's go see Empire. Right, <laughs> right. That's cool. Yeah. So, what, what? So, how did you get your break to start writing Star Wars? Tell me a little bit about that. Like, how did well, how did that come about? Well, um, uh, actually, uh, uh, Del Rey um, uh, paid me a great deal of money for uh, an original book of mine called Heroes Die, mm. and then after they had purchased the book and but before it was time to do the publicity and stuff like that it uh, they spent an immeasurably greater uh you know millions of dollars 
uh, acquiring the rights to publish Star Wars books. Mm. And so they're so th this is my this is my kind of inside baseball assumption um, mm. that 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 uh, they uh, uh, didn't their publicity people didn't have attention to spare mm. for uh, my book. And but on the other hand, um, my editor there was was um, the editor who originally bought that book was, I think, slated to work on Star Wars and her assistant after she left her assistant uh, did work on on Star Wars. And I think it was it was the two of them together that kind of went to. Uh, Lucas books and said said hey we've got this Matt Stover guy what do you think about him and they gave me a chance to write uh, a book for the New Jedi Order which is called Traitor it's the one that didn't you didn't show in your I didn't show yeah yeah yeah, yeah. There, um, there's too many to show right. uh, <laughs> um, the uh, and um, I was originally I was not going to do it but um, uh, Bob Salvatore, R.A. Salvatore, and uh, Mike Stackpole uh, kind of grabbed me by the collar at a world fantasy convention and said, are you nuts? You have to do it. It's Star Wars. You will Nothing you ever write will be read by as many people as anything you write for this franchise. Mm. And I was like, well, that's probably true. I'm going to bring up a, a list of your books here <laughs> so everyone can see. Mm -hmm. So, so that's really interesting to me because um, you you pretty much, you know, you get you get this huge break on your original uh, book there, Heroes Die, which now I'm actually extremely interested in that, um, and you almost had to get talked into uh, writing the Star Wars uh, stuff. I, I did have to get talked into it. I I had no interest in doing uh, in doing media tie in fiction, and now it's turned out to be like half of my career. Yeah, that's. Do you think it's a happy uh, story? Like, like, uh, like, uh, like uh, Obi Wan says, it's, it's another happy landing. Or, well, let me put it this way: if I had not um, done that, you wouldn't be talking to me right now. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So it's so, you know. So I, for yeah, one, true. I am I glad it was, that you it was did a great it. idea. I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad they uh, they uh, talked me into it. Cool. Um, are you uh, so I, I worked on a fan film. I did a fan film uh, for Vader a couple of few years ago, and I'm doing a part two and I finished the script. Are you for hire? Can I can I can I hire you for working am, on that script with I'm me? Or? I'm absolutely for hire. Um, OK, I'm not a screenwriter. Right. No, I, I have, neither I am I. Written, I'm, I have written some screenplays, but they did not turn out well for me. So, um, but yeah, if you wanted, if you wanted to talk to me about, uh, I do, um, stuff I'm yes, I, this, I am absolutely, this, I am a professional writer, which is to say, if people pay me, I will write, I will pay you to write. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I That's would love for you to, to look at my story and, and yeah, uh, chat chats blown up. Uh, I think that would be pretty cool. So I already have well, the full, I, full story. I, I out. I also but... tell you that, that, uh, um, if, if you want, if you, if all you are interested in is my opinion on your story, I'll do that for free. I'm a, I'm, no, I would pay you for all of that. Okay. And right. yeah, absolutely. And, um, also to, I have the story done. Um, it's, I find it pretty emotional, but I would love for you to add to it or okay. erase some things or, you know, now is this an authorized project or what does that mean? Uh, I'm what I mean to say it's a fan is film. it's a fan film it's a it's a fan okay. film it's fan, but it's okay um, so the first one I did I released three years ago it has about 21 million views or something like that mm -hmm. a lot of fans enjoyed it and the second one is the continuation obviously to that right it's between Vader and Mace Windu okay um eight months after Revenge of the Sith so this is okay right up your well, alley. You know, I, I tried to leave I tried to leave it open in the book as it is left open in the film as to whether or not Mace survives it's a fan film yeah right um, I'll tell you all about the 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 details later off there because yeah, I don't want to spoil after, it. But... After we're off the after we're off the. Uh... Do you think? Yeah, and, uh, and... Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. The only the only the only reason I ask is I am not sure uh, what my legal status is and uh, as far as 
Fantastic. I will make it legal. <laughs> True. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe not. Um, um, I, it it may be there. There are some there are some things in the in my contracts that I'm still uh, bound yeah. by. So look, I would recommend yeah, that we cease thing. this conversation and take it offline so that you could do a little research. We don't want to get you in trouble. Right. We're very, we're very grateful for your time. Yeah. Um, you know, um, but I do have a question regarding this topic. Um, do you think May survived in your head when you were writing it? I was hoping he was going to, because we know that that a number of Jedi survived um, you know, um Revenge of the Sith. Right, we've seen them in in many other um, uh, productions. Sure. Um, I was hoping that he would survive, uh, partly because I was hoping that I would get a chance to write another book about him because I like him a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, in the in the the script that I got, the last we see of Mace is is him falling off the side of the building, right, and. That's uh, in the book. I think I have I his last line. Last line about him is that he fell forever. Yeah. Mm. Um, oh, I like that. But uh, so yeah, I I I thought it would be perfectly plausible if he had survived. But I am guessing from what I've seen of of things since that uh, Mr. Lucas does not agree with me there. Interesting. Did, did you ever get to meet Sam Jackson through through no. this whole process? No, no, I have not. Uh, I have not met any of the uh, of the actors. Um, I uh, I shared a stage with uh, I think it was Temuera Morrison oh, cool. at a yeah. celebration, but uh, I didn't really didn't really talk to him. I was kind of busy at that. That was the that was the one in. 2005 when revenge of the sith was was oh wow out. so that was my, in atlanta my schedule, right? my, excuse me was that in atlanta that indianapolis one? indianapolis okay uh, and my yeah. schedule was pretty full that weekend that's cool um did, did, did you have any involvement in the video game no okay and, there, and there well, I, I should ask which video game, but the, I. But, i'm sorry the revenge of the sith video game but no i i was not involved with any of the games i've played a few of them but I've never, I was not uh, consulted in any way. Cool. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Uh, though, no, there's there's a bunch of people in chat saying that they want to create a GoFundMe for 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 you for any of the stuff that your your medical things that you may need help for. Is that uh, I, I'm 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 good on that. I I have okay. I have Obamacare now. Okay. It's, we we, it's, we all love you. We all appreciate it's you. It's been a godsend for, for me. Let me let me just tell you that you got a lot of fans that, that want to help. So yeah. Okay. All right. Um, moving on to the Tenebrous Way, which is <laughs> the idea of the Maxi Chlorians. I thought was something that uh, I never thought of before. Um, in that, I can't really call it a novel. What would you call it? Like a, a short passage, story. short story. Yeah. Um, you essentially go on the details of Tenebrous as he dies, and he is viewing Plagueis, sort of collecting his midi Chlorians. Um, and then his maxi chlorians are going and attaching themselves to his skin and in his mouth and his nose and essentially infiltrating all of his cells and his midichlorians to live through him. But doing that, he cuts Plagueis's ability off from seeing the future and then sees that Plagueis is going to die mm -hmm. at the hands of Palpatine. And then so he eventually just dissipates and he's like, I can't do this I, and, and leaves his body and then He's there for, you wrote like thousands of years or or, or yeah, decades. Yeah, he discovers that he is not <laughs> leaving his body. He's not actually means he's uh, gone. Right, right, right. Um, anything you want to talk about in regards to that? I thought uh, it was it was really it was passage. really just a. I think I can't even remember who was the editor who approached me about that, but uh, they. They uh, just told me they wanted a, a Darth Tenebrous story because okay. um, uh, Jim Lucino had referenced him in in his. Uh, I, I guess it's a Plagueis novel, although yeah, it's been a few years. I don't I don't really remember. Yeah. But um, 
but they they asked me for a tenebrous story and uh and i thought that given the uh given the name mm-hmm. uh which is latin for like darkness for darkness or gloom or whatever if i recall correctly um i thought it might be it might be nice to do a little bit of like a straight up horror story you know, uh, talking about some of the consequences of devoting your life to dark side. And, uh, that was, that was the main, that was the whole inspiration that, that, and I stole the last line from a Harlan Ellison short story. Oh, which, which line? Um, I'm, I'm pretty what? sure that, uh, I've got it right the, here. Last, the last line is him referencing something about, um, needing to scream, but he no longer had a mouth. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And it was at that moment he he realized that he wished he had him. Let me let me try to find it. But yeah, that was yeah. I love that part. Um, yeah, well, that's that's because Harlan, my probably my single favorite Harlan Ellison story is called "I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream." Yeah, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Then he knew, and at that moment, he wished he still had a mouth because he really, really needed to scream. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was that my was, favorite that line. Was, story. That was twisted and dark and freaky as hell. Mm-hmm. So you can just kind of see him as this. So would would you say that that's maybe the first, um, not the first, but a, the, a way that the Sith can become Force ghosts, sort of, after it's death? Because he's dead at this point. That was more or less what I was thinking about. Was yeah. that, that the uh, that this was uh, this was Plagueis's idea of uh, you know this was the living forever that yeah. Plagueis thought he was going to achieve, and it turns out that yeah, um, uh, his master did yeah, but it wasn't what he was expecting to be yeah yeah. Yeah, it's a great it, it's a great theme throughout literature, right? The uh, the ultimate power of the dark side, in many incarnations, is the ability to live forever. But you know, typically, you know, obviously in stuff like um, the Odyssey or in Dracula, the that ability to live forever is in fact a curse. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, and um, you know, maybe that's what Plagueis, even Plagueis, was 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 a too. Um, you know, had a little too much hubris to to understand that that's the right. reality of living forever. Yeah, that's that's cool. Is there? I'm really intrigued now. Just hearing you speak and the way that your mind functions is is fascinating to me. Is there a Star Wars story that has always been kicking around in your head that you haven't been able to get down on paper that that you want, you wish you could, or or one day may? I I um. Back before we knew there was going to be a sequel trilogy, mm. um, I did lobby um, for the opportunity to write the final adventure of the big three. Mm. Wow. That's, that's what, because I thought that that would, um, I thought it would be really interesting to write. It would be yeah. um, uh, really uh tragic but could also be uh extraordinarily cool um i i think that i have a a little bit of track record in star wars for for tragic but ultimately cool um kind of a little bit writing like well yeah so um so i thought i thought yeah well you know because people ask me they would ask me after revenge of the sith you know what what would you uh what would you really like to do if you could do anything? This was this was always from fans. So that, yeah. Um, and I I told them that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to do the final adventure of the big three. But now we, we have seen the final adventure of the big three. And, so, and what was what was mm-hmm. your sort of quantum you know alternate reality? For, didn't have an adventure. didn't have one. Did not have a did not have a plot for it. Um, I just I liked it as as a concept. Mm-hmm. What did you think of the final adventure of the big three that we actually did get? Um, I liked some of it. Uh, I, I, um, 
I tend not to uh, criticize um, uh, works of art because everybody has a, has their own reaction to them. There there are there are some people who uh, like uh, the the sequel trilogy uh, much much more than I do. There are also some people who like it much much less than I do. I thought there <laughs> there were a lot of good things in it. Um, I actually I really liked. Um, uh, the Last Jedi, a lot. You did it, okay. It is probably my second favorite film of the whole franchise. Really? Yeah. After Empire or after Sith? After Empire. Okay. Yeah, but you know, Rogue One is in there too. Oh, interesting. True. Rogue One is a dynamite film. It's not not part of the Skywalker sequence, yeah, but mm-hmm. uh, it's a really really good movie. Yeah. What did you particularly enjoy a lot about um, the Last Jedi? I I just I first of all I love the way it looked. Um, yeah, okay. I think Ryan Johnson has a, and I don't know who the director of photography was, but uh, but they just did a phenomenal job on everything was everything was uh, fascinating and beautiful at the same time. It's very visually pleasing for right. sure, yeah. and I really liked. The because because I am the way I am, I liked the desperate circumstances of the heroes, where things just keep getting they they start out kind of bad and they get worse from there, and they get worse and worse and worse till it's till you're left with just the last core group, and mm-hmm. they have to find a way to keep on fighting. Um, that uh, that storyline, that kind of storyline for the middle film of a trilogy is right. sort of iconic. I mean, that's, that's, that's empire as well. Steve, right there. Steve Yedlin is the cinematographer and he's okay. actually a, a fascinating guy. I've had the pleasure of, of interviewing well, him at tell him I think he's brilliant. And uh, he actually has a website that you can go check out where he teaches his fundamental practices of cinematography and gives <clears> courses online. Steve Yedlin is a, a fascinating dude. He's also was uh, Ryan Johnson's childhood friend, and okay. every single movie that Ryan Johnson has ever done has been photographed. By really? Edlin. Yeah, that's interesting because I I really like the way his movies look. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think The Last Jedi is a beautiful looking film. Yeah, I personally didn't like it, um, kind of at all. You know, like I thought the the Force FaceTime stuff was interesting. The sort of telepresent dialogue mm-hmm. was was was. Uh, enthralling to me, like I, I, I enjoyed seeing them having this kind of Romeo and Juliet thing mm-hmm. from afar. Um, but you know, beyond that, I, it just didn't land for me. But well, I can't I think, argue with the fact how it looks absolutely stunning. Yeah, and I, I think that that would have worked better if they had paid it off a little differently in the third film. Mm, I, I agree with that. I feel like the ninth was sort of just retconning a lot of the stuff from eight. And for me, the stuff in eight was, it just didn't seem linear with what George had made and with, with Luke's story. Mm. And I was like, oh, Luke wouldn't be this way or that way. And then, you know, shout out to your other book. And this is, I think, the one that I have not read. Mm-hmm. I have not read, I've read a few chapters of it, but that was a very long time ago. I haven't read the full book, but I have it on Kindle, so I'm going to be reading it, especially after this interview. Well, the- would you... Luke Skywalker in the Shadows of Mindor is is definitely a, a departure both for me and for the the uh, expanded universe because um, when when I wrote Traitor I was on a panel uh, moderated by uh, Bob Salvatore because mm-hmm. uh, we we were both New Jedi Order authors right okay and uh, he accused me of introducing metafiction to the Star Wars expanded universe. For traitor, and traitor, strictly speaking, is not metafiction. It just what, what doesn't. What is metafiction? It well, it's it is it is fiction about fiction. Basically, it is it is a story about about storytelling as much as the actual events of the story. Interesting, right? Um, and uh, Luke Skywalker, and when I ended up doing Luke Skywalker in the Shadows of Mindor. Um, with a special shout out to Mike Kogi, um, a terrific writer who gave me the idea for that book 
He said, well, why don't you do something where about uh, Luke's, the transition, Luke's transition between being a, being a, uh, a soldier to being strictly a Jedi. And I said, awesome. Uh, that's exactly <laughs> what I'll do. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, the, the, the actual story in, uh, in Luke Skywalker in the Shadows of Mindor is a story about the stories that people had been telling about Luke Skywalker. Oh, wow. That's oh, interesting. interesting. Okay. It's kind of like that. Uh, Disney just did a book like that, too, about Luke uh, for the sequels. I forgot the name of it. I don't know, chat, if you guys can figure it out. Um, but it was essentially just people around the galaxy, like sitting around campfires and stuff like that, talking about the legend of Luke Skywalker. From, from right, a certain right, right. point of view or whatever? Oh, no. It, but but it, was like, it, it was like crazy things. Like he was in space. He was fighting people. And he jumped out of his cockpit in space and was like right. slashing his lightsaber around. It was like, you know, mythological sort of grander than life stories right. about Luke that people had yeah. embellished right. for hope and, and all and this. That's, that's kind of what Luke Skywalker in the Shadows of Mindor is. Cool, okay. Uh, one of those grandiose stories, but it, it's also um, well, the, the, the sort of opening uh, epigraph uh, mm. of, the, of the book is mm. a quote from Luke um, saying, none of the stories people tell about me can change who I actually am, who I really am. I see. And I, I, that was my kind of guiding light when I was writing that book. I actually put it, I wrote that on a, in 48 point type on a uh, piece of paper and, and posted it on my wall right in front of my computer. Right. So always, that was always there. And it's and about so people trying to use the legend of Luke Skywalker for nefarious ends. And as somebody who's given Luke Skywalker life in in your own way, what what do you think Luke Skywalker is about? I think I think Luke's um, great power is his uh, his compassion, the, his his ability to feel what other people are feeling, mm -hmm. and his ability to uh, look at um people more completely than even the franchise itself often does you know he he looked at darth vader and saw a person instead of just a monster and yeah. um that's 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 an extraordinary power and i think it's one that we should all emulate is try 1000 percent agree with that and right. that's i think my biggest problem with, with the last Jedi. Jedi. yeah is that he looks at a person and sees a monster instead of seeing a person when yeah, he looks well, at his nephew he, what's your view on that i probably he arguably saw that uh that he was going to uh kill han oh That's that's what I always figured that 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 would be that would be a trigger that would make Luke um, do something that drastic. First of all, you just blew my mind because I don't know if I've ever. <laughs> I never thought of it like that. Yeah, yeah. I love. I mean, it was it was because it was because, because then it gets very emotional, right? Then it gets very emotional because he can he, wow. he can see the future, as we know. Right, right, and and if he looks at his nephew the son of Han and says, you're going to kill Han. You're going to kill your father instead of what I did, which was save my father. Right. And you're also going to kill my best friend who, uh, you know, is as responsible as anyone for the uh, downfall of the empire. Right. Right. And you can have that moment of doubt, right. Mm -hmm. um, standing over his body and, and, and his sleeping. Hmm. Right. Because, in the script, or at least in the he's movie, not a, he's not a killer, right? And you, you know, you do get that Rashomon effect um, during those retellings of that scene, mm. and in in none of them, he strikes him down in cold blood. He just threatens the idea, right? Like, mm. like there, mm -hmm. there's never the actual striking. It's always the temptation of the right. striking. It's interesting. That blows Look, my that, mind. Uh, yeah, I've, I've never. That's why I love 
like t sometimes talking about this to people who aren't just an echo chamber of like, yeah, I don't like the movie, blah blah. <laughs> but um, it's a very interesting just, point of view. It yeah. is, it and it, it validates that moment so much more because that was a huge moment for me. I was just like, didn't do that. But <laughs> I just, I and you, you kind of stumped me a bit. I, I just still feel like he wouldn't. I guess, I guess they, I guess. Well, you you just have to ask yourself what would make him desperate enough to do that, right? Right. Because that is so that is so outside his um, yeah his nature. But I feel like if he wouldn't have done that with Vader back then, he's so much more centered he, as a as a person did, he now. Did, he did kind of do that with Vader though. When Vader says, "Oh, your sister," that's when that's when Luke gets pissed off and starts. And he has that his... that Anakin. That Skywalker bloodline where he just gets very tempered. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, mm. yeah. It's interesting. Did you ever tell Ryan that? Because I bet you, I, I, I'm, I'm going to text Ryan after this and tell him, man, I finally figured out why you did that horrific scene. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't even know why, but I found somebody who does know why. Um, well, that's 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 the real advantage of being a fan. You know, because wow. I, I was not I was not participating in the franchise at all when those the sequels came out. Right. And, uh, so as a fan, that that just that's what made sense to me. And it yeah. made made the scene work and and you know, frankly, made the whole film work. Yeah, you know, did, we, did we, you we, did you have to make sense of it? Because you were like, wait, he wouldn't do this. What would he have to what would he have to no, be going through? My my my, uh, my reaction is never no, he wouldn't do this. My reaction is hmm. well he did that why did he do that i see okay so i'm gonna ask you a follow-up because now i might walk out of this the last jedi fan which i doubt but you know look <laughs> i'm a fan of all the movies so i'm totally kidding i actually have told theory this many times i think the last jedi has maybe my favorite score of all the movies after sith like like the score of the last jedi is probably my mm -hmm. favorite like literally my second favorite of all of them but mm -hmm. um so how do you, in your beautiful writer's mind, how do you rationalize him seeing his father's lightsaber after all those years and tossing it over his shoulder? Like, what do you think motivated that choice? I think that a uh, lightsaber is a weapon of war. And Luke is done with that. He's done with killing. So that's what I think. That's what you think. Mm -hmm. Could also be seen as a as a it's weapon not, of protecting. Yeah, yeah, but it's a sword. I mean, I I I brought this up in Traitor that um, that uh, it's it's a, a lightsaber is a unique weapon mm -hmm. that um, because it it's it has no edge, but right. it's all edge. Right. At the same time, so it's a it's yeah. a contradiction, and in Shatterpoint, I talk about I have give the bad guys um, uh, these things I call vibro shields that uh, um, that um, like the vibro axe from the expanded universe um, can cut through basically anything except yeah. a lightsaber, and talk about the bad guys using their shields as swords, the Jedi using swords as shields. Mm. But <clears throat> saying that a sword is a weapon of defense is like saying that a gun is a weapon of defense. A sword is designed to take life. It doesn't have any other actual function. It can block? It can block, but it is not as good at blocking as a shield or a bracer or even a sword breaker which is um, a medieval armsman weapon, mm -hmm. like a sword, but it's basically just a long iron bar. Right. Um, these all work better. When you, if you actually do sword fighting, um, blocking, well, yeah, I, have a, I have a friend who's a kendo black belt mm -hmm. and you know, they do use their swords. Sometimes they'll go blade to blade, but that's not ideal. Because one thing, it's really, really bad for your sword. Um, but, uh, you know, your ideal is to strike before you are struck. Um, the whole counter-striking thing, hmm, in practical terms, um, it's not the most 
uh, pragmatic way of of uh, surviving a fight. Mm -hmm. So, so you think after he makes this emotional error in judgment by trying to defend Han Solo's life by killing his nephew or or threatening to kill his nephew, that then results in the Jedi Academy being destroyed. That Luke's was done with war, was done with defense, was done with offense, right. and alienates himself on on the planet. Right. I I think that I think that he decided to uh, do the Yoda thing because um, he realized that his real enemy is is um, himself, and that the only the only real way um, he can have peace, which is the Jedi ideal, is to find find his own peace. Follow your own bliss, right? Like, uh, uh, not exactly, but but uh, he he I think recognized how fundamentally dangerous the Jedi are. That that um, again, um, I think that uh, might might be Lord of the Rings, um, where they they say that power to do good ends up being just power. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, I think he made a choice to uh, protect the galaxy from him. From his power. Yeah, well, from him, his power, he is his power. Yeah. They're, they're not separate. You can't take it away from him. Right. Don't you think a Jedi, well, like a Grandmaster at that point would be able to control his power and use it for protecting yeah. the ones he loves and you know, his sister and instead of just abandoning them. to, to, yes, I think he could, uh, start that way, but yeah. you know, there, there's a reason why, uh, Yoda and Obi-Wan and everybody, uh, where Anakin, Anakin says it in, I think, attack of the clones where he's levitating in, uh, some kind of fruit with Padme. And Obi yeah. yeah, yeah. Obi-Wan would be very upset. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, yeah. very grumpy with me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> very grumpy. Because, <laughs> using that power for anything other than protecting people is insane. Just power. Dangerous. It's just power. Yeah. And it is, it is the path to the dark side. It is the path to going for what you want rather than for what is best. Yeah. And that's yeah, what, is... that's what, that's yeah. actually what he was about to do. Oh, um, yeah. Standing over, uh, standing over Ben, right. He was going for what he wanted rather than what was right and he made a terrible mistake and um i think that uh, that he was not willing to risk making that kind of mistake again could we argue that that mark if i could i'd love yeah, to know yeah, your yeah. point of view on this yeah. and i want to be respectful of your time because you've already yeah. given us over an hour um my question is if he thought this way in the original trilogy then the empire would have continued to succeed and they would have taken over everybody and they would have had their iron fist ruling right. the entire galaxy right but, he but it was because to, of his control he didn't it, have reason of, to doubt himself then and he has reason now i would say so he almost killed his nephew oh well, what if ryan just didn't write that in there that's just my take. <laughs> it's a good, first of all, it's a, it's a very good take. Yeah, you, and, and, you, and, and you, Alan made Dean me... Foster. We, we had Alan Dean Foster on the show as well. And, Love and that it was guy. also, yeah, it was also a fascinating um, interview because Alan Dean Foster said just as elegantly as you did, right? Gave a, an extra insight into Maz Kanata potentially being one of the wills, you know, that that's kind of how Ooh. he saw it, you know, and then that to I can me. See that. Yeah, and that to me illuminates the character by a factor of 10x. Because mm -hmm. like, as of now, she's worthless in my opinion. But when you get a little extra bit of insight, well, maybe she's one of the wills, right? And that you know, you can have a little bit of fun with that. Mm -hmm. Then it then it starts to really expand the universe. You yeah. know, the, yeah, no, no, I could I could totally see it. I think yeah, your, yeah. Your, I think that's your a logic great concept. is very sound. I gotta say, your logic is very sound, and I I have never experienced someone's. Uh, point of view of the sequel trilogy so uh 
what's the word? I've never understood it so much as I do right now. Oh, well, okay. Well, so I, I, thank I'll you. Th th yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you for, for expanding my, uh, my universe, <laughs> flexing my ability to understand why people enjoy them so much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I maybe someday I will be able to. I just, I would have loved to have seen Luke, you know, like the way he ended in Return of the Jedi. I, would, I wanted to see a continuation of that right. instead of a perhaps more realistic in today's world version of the man he became later. And mm -hmm. my, but thank you for opening my eyes to that. That's it's, my, it's interesting. My counterpoint to the, you know, to your, to your very good point is that Luke having been now more experienced now potentially more aware of his ability to potentially detect the future. Right. Like mm -hmm. there's never been in a, you know, there's never been a, you know, in the movies anyway, there was never a clear thing that said, oh, Luke has the ability to see the future, right? It was never no, hard. He, just, he saw his friends in pain in, in Empire. That's why he left. Right, right, right. He, to your point, very empathic, right? Very mm -hmm. compassionate, able to sense other people's feelings. You know, my counterpoint to that in terms of the consistency of Luke's character would be if if Luke already went through the experience of trying to save his father, and ultimately being able to do it to a degree, but you know, still not being able to truly save his 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 physical self. Right, right? cost him his life. Cost, it cost his him his, his life. Right, that that Luke would be able to learn from that experience and have a uncle nephew talk and say, "Hey, man, like something's going on with you because I got to tell you, I just saw you kill your uncle. <laughs> I, I, you know, kill your kill dad. your dad. You yeah. know, and like." Right. Well, and we be mature enough to, we, to we have those. To see, we didn't get to see what their relationship was like. Exactly, exactly. Which I, um, which, which I wish we would have. Yeah, and I, I have not read uh, any of the novelizations of the sequel, so I don't know if that I've read, I've read. If that showed up, uh, if that <clears throat> they included any sort of insight into their uh, their relationship, you know, before the Last Jedi. Yeah, because I. In terms of the sequels, I I really enjoy the Kylo Ren character. I I thought he was a very very interesting wow, character. Adam Driver's really good, badass. Yeah, he was yeah, sick. yeah. He was cool. You know, The Force Awakens when he says, "Look how old you've become," like that resonates with me every time I look in the mirror. Right, like it's <laughs> it's just like there's some powerful moments that Kylo Ren has in the movies, and you know to you know to your point, I just would have loved to have seen how him and Luke kind of interacted with each other you know right. what what that relationship was like because then i think it would have paid off two things much better it would have made him killing han that much more powerful because right. to me that scene was telegraphed 25 minutes before like yeah, it was, yeah. well the, yeah. The, this is all my opinion but there was JJ no surprise Abrams is not my favorite filmmaker fair enough and that scene telegraphed for me and if you would have seen even the way that Kylo was with Han or just known a little bit more about Kylo, that scene I think would have been punchier. Right. And then again, the scene with him and Luke at the end of the last Jedi, that's the first time that they ever interact. You have no context for, right. for, for that relationship, you know, except that it's an angry kid with a cocky old man, mm -hmm. you know, like, like that, that's the only context you have, you know, and right. But look, Luke is not, actually cocky right see he's just he's baiting him right 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 he's yeah. he's baiting him to 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 buy time for his buddies right. mm -hmm. yeah yeah look it makes me wish that you would have been in that writer's room kicking a little ass and like trying to hey. get some ideas it out would never be nice that was the first thing i said when i when i heard that um they were uh um working on a sequel trilogy I, I I said, you know, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, talk about the, the Lucasfilm Story Group. I hope they're watching. I mean, the, the, this is the guy you want on there. Like, I mean, I don't understand yeah, well, why they're not hiring the 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 great authors of of the times of uh, yeah. old, which was just like 15 right. years ago. Before, before, before the Empire. Before the Empire. Yeah. <laughs> But but look, we've taken you 16 minutes past what we normally uh, uh, demand of our guests, and you've been so generous with your time. 
Um, well, it's, it's actually been a really good time. I appreciate. Uh, I really enjoy talking with you, and and I hope uh, you know even if um, and we'll talk once we go off air, maybe for a couple of minutes. But mm -hmm. I hope even if your legal stuff says that you can't be involved with the fan film, um, hopefully I could hire you as a consultant or something. Yeah, that maybe would work around. Yeah, whatever. Maybe whatever I'm, I'm not sure. I I seem to recall that that there was some clause in my contract. I'm not. I am not supposed to. Uh, even read uh, non uh, licensed <laughs> materials. It's that's it's, a lot, buddy. That's it's, what not really, it's not really an issue for me anymore because I don't work for them anymore. But uh, at the time, okay. anyway, they you know they don't if Darth Mickey doesn't mess around, right? Well, they, also, I don't I don't want to put you in a position that closes yeah. the the door future on the exactly you know, because we want to see work. we want to see your Star Wars get yeah, created. Yeah. So you know that's the priority. Um, <laughs> You know, as always, please go check out StarWarsTheory.com where you can continue the conversation um, and earn some money while you do it. Um, and um, Matthew, man, what an honor and what a pleasure. Um, I I want to go check out Heroes Die. That sounds to me really interesting because... It is not that's, a Star Wars. That's your baby. That's your baby. Yeah. You know, I'm going to definitely, definitely check that out. Uh, Heroes Die. Could you give right, me... Yeah. Uh, the kind of elevator pitch on Heroes Die. Would you mind giving me that real quick? Uh, uh, a uh, it is about uh, a legendary actor in a genre of entertainment that involves being transported to an alternate reality where he has adventures that are recorded and sent back to his audience on earth interesting so it's kind of like it's like like it has that little bit of that um uh God, what's that arnold schwarzenegger uh movie last uh, action philip hero last no, action no no, no 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 the philip k dick uh based one. Oh, uh, total recall uh no no the running man the running oh, man. Running, man. running yeah, yeah right 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 yeah, yeah. We're, we're like you're yeah, going it's, it's like this it's it except it's it is like a almost like a reality tv thing except uh um, the people that he interacts with don't know that they are part of an entertainment. Mm. And his character is the character that he plays is a legendary assassin. And the people that he kills are real people who really die. Oh, wow. Do you have any other original uh, books that you've written? Well, there's, there are four. There are okay, four. Let's, yeah, let's talk about them real quick. Yeah. Okay. Heroes yeah. die. Heroes die. Blade of Taishal. Cain Black Knife and Cain's Law. Is this about Cain, as in Cain Reaver, or uh, the same Cain? Or uh, well, Cain is uh, the character name. the The actor's name is is Harry Michelson. Okay, so 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 it's a it's a it's a they're they're, they're sequels of the same character. Yes, yeah, they're oh, they, they are they are collectively called the Acts of Cain. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's a four book series all yes. with the same main character. That's correct. Oh wow, there's a television show out there for for any producers watching. Hey. I bet um, I bet you would be badass. I yeah. am open to that at any time. It's like an opposite Truman show kind of thing, WandaVision. Right. Uh, <laughs> what it sounds right. like. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's well, awesome. Uh and everyone who so you have do you have so many fans? You have 2500 people watching right now and um a million more well on the way. Uh, you guys, your super chats, we're going to be donating that to St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Uh, we appreciate awesome. your time. And um, Matthew, we appreciate your time. Dude, you are a gem in the Star Wars community, and we appreciate all of your work. There are so many people here. I don't know if you want to watch chat or read chat on, on a replay. So many people have been saying, you know, when I was in the hospital, I was reading your books, and you, you saved my life and this and that. You've mm -hmm. really done a lot for a lot of us. And we appreciate you. We love you. And we hope to see your name again on many future books or at least future projects. Yeah. yeah. And look, I'd love, I'd love to have you back on the show and just talk more storytelling. It was, it was so much fun. Um, yeah. I am right now, you know, my afternoons are generally free. I, I work in the morning. Cool. Okay. Cool. So, um, yeah. You want to set something up? Just, uh, just reach yeah. out. All Absolutely. Right. Awesome. All right. Thank you all. Okay, guys. We will catch you later. And... See you in a bit. Rise. Rise.